Hey everyone, Chris from A Brief History of Everything here. This podcast, as we say at the in a minute at the top of it, is scheduled to be a long one. Um, it went ultra long, and what we decided to do instead was break it up into two parts. What you'll find here are the presidents from Washington all the way through to William McKinley. After this, in the next episode, you can hear from Teddy Roosevelt forward. So this will be broken into two parts. Make sure to download part one and two. Hope you enjoy. Strap yourselves in, ladies and gentlemen. This one's going to be a long one. Um, this is A Brief History of Everything. I'm Chris. I'm Thomas. And we are back. And thank you for listening to the most recent episode. We've had a really good bit of feedback from that too. Uh, it was good fun to do, good to do one. We hadn't done one in a while. Um, since that point, you've been out of the country. On yes. Legal reasons, I believe. <laughs> yes, uh, on advice from attorneys, flee the country. Yes, and, and to an undisclosed location. That's right, Cayman Islands. Yes, so... Um, since, since that last one, yeah, Thomas has been has been overseas. Um, he's obviously back in the country now. Or this is a really good hologram. Uh, technology from the future. From the future, um, I've been, well, not overseas. Uh, that's probably the best way to put it. Um, Underseas? Would that be the opposite of overseas? Underseas. Underseas? Sounds like a Stephen Seagal movie. <laughs> Underseas. <laughs> Underseas. Um, and it's, you know, again, interesting we quote, you know, I quote Stephen Seagal to, <laughs> to start a podcast about presidents. Um, now, he, he's never, I don't think he's ever played the president, but he's, I think he's always played someone protecting a Body president. Bodyguard of president. Bodyguard of, of, of president, protecting the country's assets. What we're going to be talking about today is the role of the president. I don't know why, but it just seems, just seems like it's probably... a little bit about it recently. Yeah, I think it's appropriate. Mm. Um now, we're going to not talk about the current regime. That's not going to happen. As much as we possibly um, can. Yeah, the, 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 the actual plan of this, as much as there is a plan, and normally there's a really detailed plan for what we're going to do with these episodes. With plan. Um, we're both American politics junkies, and in particular the, the history of American politics. So this is just going to be long because we're riffing on this. We, we, we've sort of talked a little bit about what we want to discuss, but it, it all leads down different rabbit holes. So we're, we're prepared for this to be long. You should be prepared for this to be very long too. Um, you're going to need to block some time, I suggest six weeks, um, <laughs> to listen to this. Um, it's going to be a big one. Um, anything else you'd like to add before we really get underway? Uh it's history as much as it's politics as well. Um, so if you're expecting the usual um, history approach, I think you'll find there's a lot more wonkishness in this than you would previously find. Wonkish, wonkishness being uh, you know, specific, in-depth political talk with terms that you may need a um, political dictionary to define here and there. I love the fact that we're, we're, we're only just into the podcast and we're already using the word wonkish. wonkish. Such a um, wonker. <laughs> you're you're right. Such a wonker. Anyway, and, and and not in the golden ticket kind of way. So very important to understand the, the discrepancy there. So the, so the role of the president, which is really what this is is sort of going to loosely be about, and we're going to chop and change all over the place. But the role of the president, as imagined by everyone, goes back to the founding fathers, and they always the founding fathers, and they pound that document, the Constitution, really hard, and go. This is what they meant. Now, I've got my own views about that, which is that the Founding Fathers always intended the document to be a living document that, that moved with times, um, reflected their values, but moved with times. But the role of the president, as imagined by, by the Founding Fathers, and a lot of it, we come back to one of our key historical words of context. The role of the president, as imagined, comes through the context of kings at that time and the way that foreign governments ran themselves. Yeah, so when we talk about the president, we're talking about the executive branch of government in America. And if you're unfamiliar with the structure of government in America, it's uh, there's three branches, the judicial, the executive, and the uh, legislative, whereas the legislative is uh, Congress, so the House of Representatives and the Senate, and the Supreme Court is essentially the judicial with all the other um, circuits and whatnot. The executive is the president. And uh, each of these three branches is supposed to keep the other in check. The phrase checks and balances will come up a lot uh, in this podcast. Uh, the Congress keeps an eye on the President, the President keeps an eye on the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court keeps an eye on Congress and the Executive. Everyone's looking and checking to make sure everyone's doing their job, but they're also balancing one, one another out so that in 
the founder's eyes, not what we see today, but in the founder's eye, none could act unilaterally and none could sort of lead the country without the other two following and making sure it's a, an appropriate leadership. And it's kind of the reason why Washington is the first president, is that when they were trying to work out, you know, what was going to happen, and there were lots of debates and discussions about who the hell was going to be that first president. One of the reasons they went with Washington was they knew this was a man that wasn't going to seek the power of kings and was not going to claim that power in a way that some others perhaps would have coveted it. Mm. He didn't really covet the role. He had to sort of be convinced. The same with um, him leading the Continental Army as well. He, mm. he never sought... It seems as though um, Washington never particularly sought roles or positions of great authority or responsibility maybe that's um it's it's a just a what you might say a, a hollow gesture maybe it's he did want them but it, you know the polite and courteous thing would be to refuse them so that it was permissible for people who didn't want him there to say oh i don't want it and he's uh sort of giving that opportunity or alternatively, maybe he was just a humble man and didn't want these positions. Well, I mean, think about it. He does spend a large part of his presidency trying to get out of his presidency. <laughs> he spends a lot of time trying to work out how he's not going to run for the second term. And then when he agrees to do the second term, makes it perfectly plain, I'm not doing a third. Yeah, like, I'm not doing this again. And he sets the precedence for sets everyone precedence. else. Exactly. Except for FDR, who manages to use circumstances as a reason to run for four terms. And as we'll come back to that in a minute, one of the big changes of the presidency, whereas that gets finally put into the constitution mm. you know of two term limits um but the, at, for most of the, the the history of america though that that two term limit that everyone talks about was convention mm. it wasn't written into any document there was nothing that said you had to stop you could have run for a third term mm. if you want a couple of people do run for third terms um but most presidents go two terms. That's, that's enough for me. And if you think about it, that's eight years. That's, that's a long time to be living mm. in a country. Um, but the early presidents, and you sort of go the first five, are feeling their way into the role and working out what this role is. I, I sort of um, get a bit more narrow with the first three, where you have Washington, Adams, and Jefferson. Mm. I... I sort of treat them as maybe the, the explorers of the Constitution. I mean, James Madison um, is regarded as the father of the Constitution. He yep. was the person who uh, wrote it and uh, sort of handed it down to Congress to argue about and whatnot. Um, he always felt in writing it that uh, the power, and his phrase is, tilted towards the House. Yep. He, before, he always felt that the House and Congress, so the legislative branch, would have more power than the executive and the Supreme Court. And he was perpetually worried that this legislative branch would be the controlling, um, sort of guiding uh, force of parliament, uh, of government in America. So, so much so that he actually divided it into two places, the Senate and the House, just to, kind of try, to try and dilute that power. So the father of the Constitution, Madison, he felt that the executive would be quite weak and when he goes on to become president, uh, uh, his actions sort of bear that out. But those first three presidencies, uh, presidencies, presidencies, uh, presidencies, presidenti, they, <laughs> they, those first three guys, what ran the country? <laughs> those three guys, uh, they're the ones who are, as I say, they're the explorers of the constitution. They're trying to find out what works, what doesn't, where do we go, what can we do. And they start to try and f uh, maybe govern from the blanks, those gaps in the Constitution where it's not necessarily explicit, and we'll come, we'll give these a, a name in a minute. Um, they sort of govern from these gaps while being sort of following the explicitness of it. Now, each three has very different approach to it, but generally these three are the people who sort of set a lot of precedent. Yeah, you know, but again, and we, we'll come back to that when we get to, you know, certain territorial mm. gains where they say, you know, the president can't do that and the response of the president in charge of the time is, it doesn't say in the constitution that I can't, mm. which means I can. Yeah, one of and, the greats for uh, that is Theodore Roosevelt. Yes, we'll come back to Teddy as well. But but there's there's a couple of presidents who, who look at the constitution and go, well, it doesn't say I can't. That must mean I can. Mm. And and I think, yeah, that those the first three, you know, Washington establishes the role. Mm. You know, and again, the guy who establishes the role really lays the the parameter and the groundwork. Mm. And and again, it was it was supposed to be this idea of the president was you know the the overseer in charge, but was more 
just sat there and waited for Congress and, and to yeah. do their thing. And they would push policy. The idea of a president pushing policy was not really ever considered at this point in time. Yeah. The president didn't have a legislative agenda. No, the president no, sat there and, and, and waited for the House and the Congress to, to, to send bills their way mm. to deal with it. And also the idea of that presidential veto, you know, we, we you don't see heavy use of the veto. Well, the first president that really starts making use of that veto is, is Jackson. Yeah, Andrew Jackson, who um, issues 12 vetoes, who which issues is more than everyone, everyone else combined. Him. And then you start seeing, you know, you get other presidents who then see that Jackson's used the veto and start using the veto more and more. But those first three, you're right, you know, and, and again, they're, they're, the first five are all part of the founding fathers. Yeah, they're all the founding Yeah, they're all the founding fathers. So the first five really get that, you know, they get it underway, they've all been involved, they've all, they wrote the document. So when they go, oh, the founding fathers meant this or the founding fathers meant that, it's one of the few times in history where you can actually say they knew what the founding fathers meant. Mm. They were the founding fathers. So I think, yeah, that, that first era, you know, John Adams, again, very much, you know, uh, the... I don't really want to say the brains of the operation, but gets a lot of credit for for his ability and his nous within that within setting up those guidelines. Mm. Um, Jefferson, for me, is always an interesting one. Jefferson's a paradox to me. So yeah, Je- the you have to sort of go back to Washington to understand the complexities of Jefferson. So in, in Washington's first cabinet, um, he's probably got the two greatest. Oh, not just the two. He's probably got amongst Americans the greatest thinkers of all time. But two of the best is Alexander Hamilton, who's Secretary of the Treasury, yep. and Thomas Jefferson, who's uh, Secretary of State. So probably two of the most influential and important positions, not just then, but through any president. And these two actually start the argument which will uh, echo on all the way through to today, which is how active should the federal government be? Alexander Hamilton, uh, and then later presidents who we'll, we will describe as Hamiltonian, yes. is talking about an active executive government with strong leadership. Jefferson, who we will go on to describe other presidents as Jeffersonian, is talking about a more reduced hands-off approach for the executive government with strong leadership as a head of state, so a ceremonial position. Their argument sort of uh, functions over how involved the executive government should be in the economy because there is no reference in the entire constitution to a national economy. So Jefferson looks at the arguments about a a federal bank and a, a, a nationwide economy and he says there's nothing about it so we shouldn't do anything about it. Whereas Hamilton is saying essentially there's nothing there so we should do something there. And this is where we get the Federalists, which is the Hamiltonians, and the Anti-Federalists, which is the uh, Jeffersonians, uh, talking about how strong or active the federal government should be. And from these first weeks in the cabinet, we see we can categorise most presidents as one of those two, Jeffersonian or and, and we get a great And we get a great read out of it in the Federalist Papers. That's right. Oh, they're <clears> which some are, of the best things you'll read. The Federalist Papers are actually wonderful to read. And a lot of these times you go, oh, it's a great document, and you'll read it, and you go, oh, this is really boring. No, the Federalist Papers are very interesting, especially if you want to know how they view one way of viewing how America should be established mm-hmm. and how it should run. And the bank becomes the first major domestic crisis point mm. within what the powers of the government are. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll talk about Monroe and Madison just, just briefly. Because mm-hmm. you get the first three who are just so busy trying to find, the way. find it all up. And then you've also got the big issue that pops up with regards to France and Britain mm. constantly at war and what, do America, what does America do about this? And you know, the popular opinion within America at the time, support the revolution. is we always support the revolution. We we never back the British. Why don't we back the French? And in probably the first great, well, the, the thing that dictates early American policy, and again, it changes all the time. American foreign policy, but one of the earliest tenets of American foreign policy becomes we're not big enough. Yeah, non-interventionist. Stay out of it. We're all not going to get involved. I would say that that's largely a plank through the 17 and 1800s up to the point where maybe you have Roosevelt, and which is really the advent of the 20th century uh, president. It's non-intervention, isolationism uh, as the core bedrock of American foreign policy. Trade, good. Economic growth, good. But military involvement, no. And there were a lot of people that saw America's failure to back the French as betraying the values mm. of the republic. And, and 
I mean, the thing is, if you look at it from just a purely, you know, practical standpoint, America's involvement at that point in time would have been almost fatal. It would have been fatal to themselves because remembering that Canadian territories are still British, 1812 comes around, America is still not even prepared to fend off a second British invasion. So getting involved with France would have been just a precursor to a second uh, war with Great Britain, one that they may well not have won. Hmm. And again, so the, the, the War of 1812 brings us to Madison and, and brings us to Madison and Monroe. And these are the first two that start really fleshing the role out a little bit more because we're now at a point where, well, well, first of all, Madison has to you know, work out how to repel the British again, mm-hmm. um, which, and again, it's by the time you get to the end of Monroe, America, I think, finally feels secure in the fact that it's, it's not going anywhere. I think it's by the end of the Monroe presidency, America suddenly works out where we're okay. Yeah, it's grown some roots. Yeah. It's, a, it's a solid, you know, sapling now. It's not going anywhere. But the thing with Jefferson, Madison and Monroe is they are all Jeffersonian presidents. They all see the role for the president and the executive branch as being limited uh, and not necessarily very um, le- uh, legislatively uh, involved. But the ironic thing is that Jefferson is actually more of a Hamiltonian yep. than anyone else. Jefferson's for one of his major uh, acts is the Louisiana Purchase, yes. which is not enunciated anywhere in any constitution that the president can buy whole swaths of land and extend the territory, and yet he does so. Second one is he is embroiled in a heap of arguments over internal improvements, what we would call today infrastructure. Yeah. He's arguing that the federal government should be building roads and canals to improve the lot of lives of people. But nowhere in the Constitution does it say the federal government can collect taxes to then spend public money on infrastructure on, across states. Uh, that's a state government thing. Yeah, and it become, it takes forever to get to an income tax base. Yeah, it, it oh, really all does. All the way up to Wilson. Exactly. In, uh, 19, <clears throat> uh, Again, yeah, and it, and it's, it's using the war as a sort of, you know, we're going to need some money, guys. Um, how about we take those powers? And again, it's the start of the, the gradual stripping of power and the president's gradually starting to claim the power. And But Madison and Monroe, yeah, as you're right, they're both very much... Keep it, keep it narrow. Keep it small. Yeah, hands just, off. You know, we don't do much. We just let we let the Congress do what it's going to do. Our role is to guide. Our role is to 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 lead and facilitate. But we're not here to run the show. Mm. Really, it's it's a figurehead. I think they no. see there's dueling uh, sort of jobs for the president. I mean, there's a, a list of six chiefs of what they are, but it essentially boils down to head of state and head of government. Yeah. Um, I think Madison and Munro would say the head of state supersedes head of government and the head of government is essentially whoever's in charge of Congress, whereas um, your much more active presidents, your Roosevelt's, your Wilson's, uh, your, your Johnson's, they're going to be saying the head of government is the head of state and to govern and legislate is to be the leader of your nation. Exactly. And I think... Again, Madison and Monroe, while they're, while they're smaller base in terms of what the, what the role of the president should be, they actually have a very large part in, in expanding what America becomes, especially James Monroe. I mean, Monroe's role, I mean, he's the bridge from the founding fathers into John Quincy and, and Jackson. He's the last of those. And he's the last of those. And again, also you're looking at territorial expansion as well mm. and the discussions around what America has the right to expand to. And again, you, you pointed out with, with the Louisiana Purchase under Jefferson is this fleshing out of what the role of the president is. Can the president just unilaterally go, we want this territory by it. Mm. Well, in the Constitution, does it say he can? No. But in the Constitution, does it say that he can't? Now, Jefferson no. was willing to wait for a constitutional discussion or even an amendment to say that it was possible. However, the expediency of the moment, which was France was going to sell it, and if it wasn't to America this week, it was going to be to Spain next week, yeah. Jefferson needed to act unilaterally. So he threw away his, his core beliefs just to act. And that precedence gives Madison and Munro a larger base of power. Even mm-hmm. though they're saying, oh, we don't want to expand the power, they're benefiting from the precedence of previous ones. And that's something that will be an echo throughout all of this. Every president who comes along doesn't necessarily set out to attain more power, but they are gifted more power because the previous president has taken a bit. They've taken one little bit, next one takes a little bit, and all of a sudden you've got 40-something extra bits that you never had planned to get yourself. Exactly. And I think... The big change, the first big change that we see after all, all of those, the base level discussion, is 
you have the first, after these guys, you have the first president raised to be a president. You're the first person who is basically raised with the goal of you are going to be president of the United States, John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is told by his family, Mm. basically, when he goes over to England, he goes over to England and the letter is written, if you do not uphold the values, I'd rather you sink in the sea and die. He was sent as a, um, like an apprentice to the ambassador to Russia when he was uh, some 14 years old or something. This this is a guy, this is a guy who his family, you know, know, John Adams and, and, and the family just basically, he was raised to be president. He was told you're, you're going to run this country. And, I mean, the way that he, he gets it in itself is a big turning point and a big talking point within America because it's the first time that there's really a discussion about the Electoral College. The Electoral College is just something that everyone just accepts and this is what's going to happen. And that election, that first election, where John Quincy Adams loses the popular vote to Andrew Jackson, and it's not a close mm. vote... And then the Electoral College is in Adams's favour, but it's a really close call. It goes back into the, into the Parliament, and Henry Clay, who has a lifelong blood bitter feud with Andrew Jackson, is the kingmaker, yeah, and, and gets the vice presidency. Yeah, yeah Clay Clay swings it. Clay swings it all around. And I'll count Calhoun's. Yeah, sorry. Calhoun's his vice president, but. He Clay sort of swings the balance of power towards John Quincy Adams, and it's it's this first idea of the populist movement versus the the way the founding fathers would have wanted it, mm. you know. And again, the the concept of the electoral college, it's become quite contentious. Again, it probably shouldn't have, but it has. Is that the original purpose of it was that the public wouldn't know who the nominees for president were. You needed people who knew these people to vote. Yeah, it was also a stopgap measure. So if something went wrong, i.e. someone won the popular vote that was clearly um, not fit for office, the Electoral College could overturn the will. That's the the protection plus the the idea of knowing or not knowing who you're voting for. These are the two reasons why the Electoral College was uh, initiated. I would suggest that it's failed largely in both fronts. Number one, we all know who presidents... Yeah. Are, or candidates are, and number two, they've already failed to stop someone manifestly. Un- uh, no, we said we weren't going to talk about. But that you're first, right. Yeah, they've they've stopped someone who's manifestly unqualified um, for the role. Yeah. Um, but but it's an interesting point because Jackson, and again, there's a lot of people comparing current to Jackson, and I mean, again, I've got a lot of time for Andrew Jackson, so I take that kind of it's an affront. a bit as an affront, or very much as an affront, because. Jackson wins the popular vote. Jackson doesn't win doesn't win the electoral college. He loses the college. John Quincy Adams becomes president. He's a brilliant man. He's boring as all hell, but he's a brilliant man. Um, but he was also a stubborn man and couldn't work with well basically anybody. And it's the first example you really get of a president and a congress. Yeah, they, they can't work together. They cannot work together because Adams just believes that he's right and he's always been right and Adams is going to do what Adams wants to do. It's also a first in that previously to this, the, 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 the elections have been very gentlemanly. Mm. They've been, you know, again, these are all friends. Oh, except for the Jefferson Adams. Well, Jefferson Adams, yeah, but, but again, Jefferson had that in him. This was the birth, the birth of party politics yeah. there as well. Again, the, the, the Quincy Adams, Andrew, and again, I, I highly recommend... There's a couple of elections I highly recommend that you, you go and, and examine further in more detail that we're going to have time for. John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, is the first one of those that I really suggest you go out and have a bit of a look at. It was vicious. It was nasty. They really laid into each other in a very personal manner. It wasn't policy. They weren't playing policy. They were playing people. And Jackson spends four years believing he's been robbed and telling the country, I was robbed. Um, John Quincy Adams spends four years trying to convince everybody, look, I won. I won via the way that I'm supposed to win. I won. Um, And their debates are not as policy-driven as you would expect from this period of time. It's not a, a question of a big America, a little America. It's not a question of any of those sorts of things. It just becomes... 
nasty because again Jackson's got a past you know he's the hero of the Battle of New Orleans he's the hero you know again Battle of New Orleans Jackson's not he's the first one in this sort of era he's a non-politician he had no interest in politics early on he was again he's a general you know he's very much Washington in that regard of he's a very well regarded famous general and again America's got a bit of a habit of electing these people too you see a few examples you see Grant you see Eisenhower um, Washington, obviously, and and Andrew Jackson. Again, he's a military hero. He's a war hero. He's a tough-as-nails, uncompromising guy. And he's not playing politics in the way that everyone else plays politics. He panders to the people. Mm. It's the first personality candidate you see. Yeah, so certainly the rise of popularism. Yes. Um, with I think that there's also some substance to the policy argument and it, it, it really does um, mirror what happened most recently which is the supporters of one candidate uh, are voting for a, a politician who is saying all the right things but whose policies will enact uh, the negative for those supporters so with Jackson Quincy Adams and Henry Clay formulate um, the American system which is this uh, sort of infrastructure program that will ultimately benefit farmers who are the main supporters of uh, Jackson. Now, Jackson runs on the campaign that the American system is purely and utterly this northeastern conspiracy to disadvantage the sort of working class or the farmer class, the rural society of America and Quincy Adams is out to get you, when in actual fact the, benefit, the benefactors of uh, the American system would in fact be the farming class of people in America. And so the the policy takes a backseat to the message and the message doesn't gel with the policy but we again see an argument um, over what is the powers and role of the executive is it this um, active uh, Hamiltonian style like yes we're going to build infrastructure or is it the uh, Jeffersonian style of Jackson which is like no we need a reduced uh, federal government and it needs to have its hands off these are the sort of it's a continuing debate of what is the power of the executive and the, the and again we mentioned it before we foreshadowed it before but Jackson engages in one of the first big domestic arguments about role of government when it comes to the federal bank mm. And again, the bank to renew it. the bank is not not as it's sort of known today. It was up for tender, mm. and you know the bank was sort of an independent body, and it came up for tender. To renew and when, the lease, and when the bank comes up for tender under Jackson, he vetoes it and goes, mm. "No, we're not doing that. We're not renewing the bank." Uh, you know, again, the, the the infamous story of of um, Van Buren coming into his office and he's laying on the couch sickly and. You know, what's wrong, Mr. President? He says, the bank <laughs> the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. Yeah. And it becomes this great battle of... These bank wars yeah. that starts with all these regional banks as well. It's... Yes, and, and, and the problem under this is that Jackson eventually, you know, he, he wins his battles. But the consequence of all of Jackson's actions, Jackson's actions, is that when <laughs> Martin Van Buren comes in... He's handed an economy that's falling apart because mm. Jacksonian fiscal policy wasn't stunning. It's non-existent. It was basically non-existent. You know, this was a general. He he knew how to get mm. things done, but fiscal policy wasn't a strong point. And when when he comes in, Van Buren's handed an economy that's just dying. Mm. It's 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 falling apart, and the battle was won, but it, but the cost of America. Mm. Uh, they've, they've sort of. Um, economics hasn't really been a bedrock of presidential politics until FDR. Uh, yeah. It was things you might argue or contest over, but I mean, things like uh, the gold or silver standard or the bimetal standards, these are things that Congress decides. Uh, you know, no one's talking about things like inflation or unemployment rates, A, because there's no real way to measure these things in yeah. this time and age, but the dominating economic theories. I mean, we don't have um, Keynes's economic thought of, well, we need to keep, you know, hands on the levers at all time. The dominant thought was if there's money in the economy, uh, if there's too much money in the economy, things will be bad. So the government needs to make sure there's not too much money in the economy and take away surplus money. And this is obviously uh, irrational to us now, but the dominant thought was very similar to what Jackson was proposing, which is why his um, poor economic theories were not only uh, voted in by his supporters, but also carried on by the, the successive presidents who come next, the Harrison, the Tyler, and the Pope, in what is largely called the age of Jackson. Now, now 
I'm going to sort of take it a little bit on a, on, a, on a tangent here in terms of we're talking about economic policy, fiscal policy, the changing role of the president in the hands-on, hands-off. But we do end up very shortly with the other, a very important development in the role of the president, which you wouldn't really... When you're writing the document, you'd be surprised when you look at the, the Constitution um, how little it was focused on, which is the role of the vice president. Mm. Now, this becomes really important under William Henry Harrison. <laughs> you know, the oldest man to assume, to assume the office, wants to show he's robust, wants to show he's young, gets up in the middle of a storm. Four-hour speech. Gives a four-hour speech, um, gives the entirety of it without an overcoat on. In the middle of winter, 32 days later, he's dead of pneumonia. His vice president... John Tyler, who he really had not given that much thought to. And this is a trend you're going to see all the way through, and we were sort of discussing it before. It's really Mid-point. after after Nixon yeah. is when it's essential. But, I mean, you do see some other good examples of good vice presidents. Mm. But Nixon, after Nixon is the first time that everyone really goes, we really need to give deep thought into this. Mm. The vice presidency used to be a place you put your political opponent that you wanted to hide. Mm. You used to put him in the vice presidency because there's no, there's no it's role. No there's, there's a great, um, I like the um, American humorist Tom Lehrer, who's got a lot of political songs, and he used to do a song um, called Whatever Became of Hubert Humphrey, um, Whatever Became of You, Hubert, and was talking, and one of the lines in that is, does Lyndon, recalling when he was VP, say, I'll do unto you like they did unto me? Because <laughs> Hubert Humphrey, you know, was the most non-vice president of vice presidents ever. Um, and and in, in, that, in the lead-up to that, he says, you know, does anyone remember Hubert Humphrey? He used to be a senator. Um, at this point, he's the vice president of the United States. It was the job. You used to bury people you didn't like in the vice presidency because there's no power in it. Joe Biden, in a speech the other day, said, if you read through the role in the Constitution of the vice presidency, it's vacant. Yeah. There's no real role. It's defined by whatever the president wants it to be. Well, one of my favourite um, sort of writers online, one of the politi- political websites, they say... Really, the only obligation is to wake up, make a phone call to the White House, check the president's alive, and then go back to bed. <laughs> That's essentially all you have to do. And then if the Senate calls you that there's a tie-breaking vote needed, you go and turn up to that. Other than that, you have nothing else to do. It's one of the greatest jobs. Yeah. It's one of the greatest jobs ever. Aspire to be as productive uh, as the vice president. Exactly. It would be perfect, wouldn't as it? As written. You know, so, so much golf. So much <laughs> golf. Um, and there's lots of them who like golf. You know, there's, lots of, there's lots of these presidents and vice presidents who spend a lot of time on the golf course not as much time in, in, in the White House, or at the time it's called the Presidential Mansion. Um, it's not called the White House yet. Um, that's, a, that's a Teddyism um, of renaming the mansion because, you know, the idea of living in the mansion doesn't really you know, sound like it's the people's president. <laughs> yeah, very working class. Um, but again, although, although, again, as I like pointing out with, with the people's president idea, Andrew Jackson really took that to new new heights well, by just, just opening, opening the doors the, at all times. Big and wheel of cheese and, and public invitation to the inauguration. Uh, those, those are the two founds. And I think that's um, something worth commenting on, the idea that the president has what you might call constitutional power or uh, I would call it hard power Mm. and then he would have soft power so how can presidents do things um, with public support well first you generate that public support and that's what I would term the soft power and that's something um, the founding fathers never needed to worry about Mm. because they were the founding fathers people knew who they were but once you get John Quincy Adams I think Jackson quickly realises well if I have the support of the people I can't be told no yeah and so he brings the people in and that's where you get the idea of the celebrity president as opposed to the the you know coalface style president mm. who's down writing legislation or being the head of state you've now got this popular president and with popularity or public support comes power yeah and again although i would say that you know the idea of a celebrity president in these times it's very different to the current Celebrity, yes, the idea of a celebrity president. Now. You know, this is this is someone who still has a background in you know, you know military style affairs and running organisation and, and getting things done. And one of the things you actually just on a quick side note before we go back to the vice presidency, one of the things you actually find with a lot of these presidents who have been generals is they're used to 
getting what they want. Yeah. They're a general. It's one of the, the it's one of the problems that Grant has with his presidency is that Grant is used to just going, this is what has to happen, and it happens. When you're dealing with a Congress, when you're dealing with the Senate, yeah. it's it's very different. You have to be more of a of, of someone who gives and takes. Yeah, chain of command is very different to checks and balances. Exactly. And the checks and balances trip a lot of generals up. And I think that's that's something that's interesting. But yeah, John Tyler as a vice president. You know, you're going, oh, we'll just put him in vice president. Who really cares? When William Henry Harrison dies, there's a scramble because no one's quite sure how long Tyler is supposed to be president for. Is he president? Is he just vice president? Is he temporarily president until, until we hold election. new elections? John Tyler is actually the person who takes the power. John Tyler makes the statement of, no, 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 read the Constitution. I am the president. And he goes as far as whenever mail is sent to Vice President John Tyler, he sends it back unopened and says, you will address me as president. I am in charge. It sort of sets, you know, we talk about things like the Supreme Court having a final say over the Constitution Mm -hmm. and things like that. But Tyler and what he did after Harrison's death sets that precedent. Mm. It's it's precedence uh, establishing the role and power of the presidency as opposed to, again, those checks and balances establishing it. So if John Tyler was a much more patient person, he might have uh, called for a constitutional convention or for amendments or to have Congress rule or to have the Supreme Court rule. However, as is the case with really anything in politics, expediency is often more important than correctness. And so John Tyler assumes the role with the expediency the executive has. And that's something to point out, again, the, um, the speed at which the executive can act it beats the Congress and the Supreme Court. Congress hardly acts now, but even at its fastest, it would take days to get anything done. Same with the Supreme Court, it can take months to get anything done. So the executive has speed on its side, and that's another way that the presidency has been able to assume more power and responsibility. It can act quicker than anyone else. Then we get... For, for me, we get a, a really interesting run. We get Polk. I like Polk. Mm. i got a lot of time for, for, for James Polk. But again, we start seeing expansion of territory picks up. We start seeing expansion of territory starting to pick up again. Mm. And Now, when, yeah, with, with Polk, it's very interesting because he is very Jeffersonian in his approach. He believes in a small executive mm. government, but based on the precedent set by Jefferson Louisiana Purchase, Polk assumes the power of being able to acquire territory. So in his mind, acquiring territory isn't expanding the mm. power of the presidency. It's just a natural power. And now. I think it's actually, I think it's actually a really interesting discussion point on presidents is that most of the presidents, when they expand the territory, their outlook is very Jeffersonian mm. in terms of the way they view the power. But circumstance seems to present the opportunity to expand the territory mm. to these presidents who... Have, don't necessarily yeah, want it. They don't necessarily want it, but you have to take it. Again, the Louisiana Purchase. If, if Jefferson doesn't do that, America's probably finding itself at war a lot more because you've now got this strip of Spanish land in the middle. Well, the Mississippi is the end of America. Exactly. So you've got... A really interesting situation. And again, Polk also, for me, is, is a fascinating character because he's he became president on the grounds of saying, I only want one term. I don't want a second term. I don't want to do this for any longer than four years. And that's the reason why he gets elected, mm. is that everyone goes, fine, four years, great. Because everyone around him who wants the job is sitting around going, I can wait four years. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to win it now, but I can wait four years. Yeah. I, I, four years' time, I'll be ready. And, and again, the other thing, with, the other thing with, which is interesting about Polk is that Polk is also an example of the, the stress that the job puts on presidents. Um, and in, you don't really see it with the other pres- the previous presidents. But Polk was a workaholic, very religious man, workaholic, worked consistently, almost, almost around the clock worked consistently, except for Sundays. Um, had no leisure time was very dour White House, the Polk White House. It was very much, there was no celebration of any kind. They were all, you know, he was very much a workaholic. He dies, I think it's within 60 days of leaving office. Mm. You know, he leaves office in, in the March, because at the time it was the, the handover was the 4th of March, and leaves power in the March, and I think he's dead by May. 
Um, I think he just had a massive heart attack. He just drops dead. It's funny how that happens to a lot of people. Like LBJ isn't alive for much longer after he's out. Yeah, um, but Pol- Polk's the first example you get of of the stress of the presidency. Wilson dies. Will, well, Wilson in dies in office technically, yeah. but we'll come we'll come to that because <laughs> that's an interesting role of the president's shift shift in itself. And and then you get sort of the last of the competence. <laughs> <laughs> the last of the and. and we, we joke a lot about presidents and who's, who's competent and who's not, but with the exception of Zachary Taylor, who was a very strong-willed and, again, has a lot to do with, and we'll come, we're going to talk about Taylor because I want to talk about the idea of slave versus free, yeah. which is another big internal domestic policy that's going to lead to the Civil War. Zachary Taylor is the first of these presidents that really takes it on. Everyone else is just sort of going. No, we're not going to. We're not going to. We're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. But as these territorial grabs start happening, mm. you start this discussion: slave state, free state. <clears throat> what are we going to do? Are we going to allow more slave states? Are we going to allow more free states? And it's this idea of the hybrid. You know, when we come to Fillmore and Pierce and and the the ineptitude of Fillmore and Pierce and Fillmore in particular coming up with the ridiculous most ridiculous compromise in history, um, of, yeah, sure, why not? Um, but Zachary Taylor is a really tough guy who's got a very strong stance on this. Mm. And Taylor believes that, no, we're not going to keep expanding slave states. It's just not going to happen. Um, he's not saying to abolish slavery as such. What he's saying is, I don't want any new new slave states. We don't yeah, was, need to do It was necessary this. in the South, yeah. but it was not to expand anywhere. Everywhere else was fine. I find the arguments over slavery an interesting one. I, I mean, there's no yeah. sort of moral or ethical argument. Slavery is an abomination. Yeah. But the interesting part of it is that the presidents assumed that it was their role to govern slavery in the state. But again... Nowhere does it say anything that the president is in charge of whether slavery exists or not in the Constitution. It's not mentioned. That's right. It, it is, in fact, endorsed to some degree with the three-fifths measurement of a slave. So, in essence, all these presidents who engage in the slavery or the attempts to stop spreading slavery, or anything, they are expanding the power of the presidency by saying, it's our right or it's my role to uh, govern on this, when in actual fact, it's another of those areas where it's assumed it was but actually wasn't part of their role. And again, it also leads to the other big debate linked to slavery, but it's a debate that still rages in America to this Mm. day, which is federal versus state power. Yeah, and that is in the Constitution. If it doesn't say that the the executive has the power or Congress has the power or the Supreme Court has the power, if it doesn't say one of those three branches has the power, it devolves to the person or the state. They have the power. So if it's not mentioned, it is it is for the uh, state government to decide or for the individual person to decide. Now, by slavery not being there and also a national economy not being there, this is where the state's rights argument comes from. However, Lincoln would say that it's a much larger human rights or um, sort of it's a larger national issue and this is why it is a, um, you know, a federal issue. It's a very complicated argument legalistically. Yeah, and I think that it's, it's a really... It's an interesting look at the, the run of the next couple of presidents. So Zachary Taylor, very strong against the idea of expanding slave states, doesn't want more slave states, figures. And again, a lot of, a lot of people at this time were not going to abolish slavery because they figured that eventually it was going to end in a natural course. Mm. A, lot, a lot of the view of people at this time who were anti-slave wasn't they just abolish it. It was... We let the South do what they're doing. We don't have peculiar it in the North. Institute. Even- yeah, eventually this peculiar institution will die out naturally because mm. it'll become more efficient to do things different ways. Mm. And it's an economic argument, and because it's an economic argument, eventually they'll just find a better way to do it. Mm. Slavery will just will just eventually naturally die 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 a death. Um, so Zachary Taylor doesn't take a moral stance and go, slavery's wrong. Zachary Taylor, though, goes, we're not going to expand it. Mm. And then in a, a t- typical American twist of fate, he dies. And you're left with Fillmore. Oh, Millard Fillmore. 
Uh, Millard Fillmore. How do we how do we define Millard Fillmore? Compromise. From... Compromise. <laughs> well, why don't we sort of come up with a bit of a deal here where we'll, we'll give a little bit of ground and we'll take a little bit of ground. Except he doesn't really help things. He he starts the train careering off the tracks. Yeah. You can you can look at Fillmore and and his compromise decision on slavery. Mm. And go, right, you want to know where the Civil War really is pushing towards it's going to happen? Fillmore. Because after that compromise, you've got this states' rights argument really picks up now. And the states are going, well, why do we have to listen to the federal government? Look, the president is even saying, Mm. you know, we should be allowed to have slave states. So, and then Franklin Pierce is almost pointless. James Buchanan is... A shame to my last name, um, and I hate that. But I'm like, don't you have a president? I'm like, don't don't remember. James. Yes, I am named after him. I don't remember. My surname is. Uh... Don't remember James Buchanan. It was horrendous. Let's get on to an interesting way to describe though a, a president, which is the most unilateral, the most going around the Congress, mm. the most I'm going to make the decisions, and I'm going to ignore. All of the Constitution and just do things the way I want to do them. Now, you think of those and go, negative traits, except it's Abraham Lincoln we're talking about. And Abraham Lincoln issues more executive orders than anybody. And, like, the Emancipation Proclamation is an executive order. Mm. It's not put through, it doesn't go through Congress. It's, Lincoln just goes, guess what? I've done it. And it's because Lincoln establishes something that, to this day, we, we often talk about with America, wartime powers. Mm. Lincoln uh, is a very... Interesting case in that um, from very, very humble beginnings, self-taught law, um, he manages, he must have just had a genius mind because he's able to grasp the intricacies and the loopholes of laws that he's writing himself to exploit them for his own advantage. I mean, I, I struggle to write anything. And yet here's a person who's writing something going, oh, but if I use this word, then later on I can actually say, oh, this word means I can do something. Genius at word. But yes, the wartime powers. Um, I mean, you would be blasted. There were so many protests when the Patriot Act was passed in 2000 and whatever under George Bush. Um, that never even got near to suspending habeas corpus, which is which what, is what Lincoln, Lincoln did. did. Yeah, Lincoln actually suspended habeas corpus. You have Not no this discussion right about it. He went, no. <laughs> he is the... If, if Hamilton had envisaged a strong executive, Abraham Lincoln is the furthest Hamilton would have ever had in a nightmare, much less a dream. Because yeah. at the end of the day, Hamilton is still a founding father who doesn't believe in the principles of democracy. Hamilton is looking at Lincoln and going, whoa, scale it back there, Bucko. So, so bring, it, bring it back. Also, where did you get your beard done? <laughs> <laughs> that's stove, that's stove top pipe hat. Discuss. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Lincoln just uh, assumes more power than any other president. But in an interesting twist, the successive... Uh, presidents actually return a lot of that power. Now, Lincoln stole, not stole, Lincoln <laughs> borrowed a lot of that power from Congress, also from states, but also just um, from the gaps in the Constitution. And from there, he developed what will go on to become the modern presidency, the much more unilaterally acting, leading from the front, active, hands-on, every lever uh, executive. And there's a couple of things that Lincoln actually establishes that, that are, you know, again, things that you wouldn't expect. Now, he, again, suspends habeas corpus, you know, basically says, until this war is over, I'm running on wartime powers, uh, which, may, again, the argument of there's a lot of things you can't, you can't do unless, you know, insurrection and things like that. And Lincoln points to those sections of the Constitution and goes, well, if you ever want to work out what an insurrection is, this is an insurrection. Mm. I can do what I want. But in the middle of this, he holds an election. You know, he has he suspended everything else. But to give you an idea about it's not necessarily, he's not doing it in a malicious way of, you know, I just want the power. Mm. Lincoln's like, we're in war. I've got to work fast. I can't wait for you to dilly-dally and I can't yeah, wait for Congress to discuss. The, the expediency of the executive is I'm issuing commander-in-chief. He really is starting this commander-in-chief idea of I am now just going to tell you what you're doing and you're doing it. He sacks his main general. He sacks McClelland. Well, it's gone. Then, two years later, he battles McClelland in the general election. Mm. He puts the country up for grabs mm. in the middle of the war against McClellan, who hates him because he sacked him. Mm. And he doesn't gain votes. Lincoln gets the exact same as what he got four years previously. And 
in some circles, Lincoln's not viewed favorably. Mm. Um, what becomes really fascinating, Lincoln is really an example of someone who after, I mean, there's, there's Harper's and those sorts of things we're talking about, how brilliant he was at the time. Mm. But Lincoln is someone who, for like the majority of the country, it's after Lincoln's time when people look back that they go, actually, that was brilliant. Yeah, I think a lot of the myth of Lincoln comes from the 20th century, looking back at a time of maybe 50, 60 years of general incompetence of presidents. And we get to this, and there is this incompetence. Light. There's, there's it's, it's the bumbling presidents, mm. I think is how it's best described. I mean, uh, when your book ended by uh, <laughs> Johnson and Buchanan, um, it's, it's sort of like being between two trash cans. I will get to Johnson in a minute because because he he has another presidential first up his sleeve. Um, but Lincoln, yeah, he suspends the Const- suspends large parts of the Constitution. He takes powers from the states. He takes powers from the Congress. He couldn't care less. He, he really couldn't because his argument is I must do what I need to do to make Save sure this union, union yeah. sa- is saved. And again, he's the one who goes and again if you if you look at the the Lincoln Douglas debates and again something i say to you a lot here is if you want to go look at something go look at the Lincoln Douglas debates great uh, argument to understand how to argue yes politics and and the Lincoln Douglas debates sort of set the, set the, the platform for Lincoln with slavery but again when he comes in he's not saying abolition he's saying restriction mm. it's the civil war that pushes Lincoln to the point of right Okay, if you want to play it like this, not only am I going to say no more slavery, but I'm just going to do it. And signs an executive order, which is the Emancipation Proclamation, and just goes, right, it's done. Mm. Now, now, part of that myth of Lincoln is that the Emancipation Proclamation freed all slaves. It didn't. It just freed the slaves in the rebellious territories, kept the slaves in the border states um, sort of in that grey area. So he was very aware of circumstances and how to mm. play popular belief and yep. how to twist law. And he, he's really the legislator-in-chief there. But he's not legislating through Congress. He's legislating through executive order, which is a principle that will become very um, sort of uh, symbolic in the 21st century. And the interesting part, too, is that to, to win the war, a man who gets a lot of credit for the values of, of human decency and his human rights values, to win the war... He goes with Grant as his general, and <laughs> and Grant and Grant as a general, ruthless is brutal. He and he had to be, again, to win that war to make the South you know come to heel as as as, as you may want to put Sherman it. Sherman as well. Yeah, he needed you know Tecumseh Sherman and and Ulysses Grant. Basically, you know, look look at what they do when they you know Atlanta. You know, <laughs> look at Atlanta or look at the charred Georgia, remains of Atlanta yeah. when they're done. Um, just to the sea. What they do is is absolutely brutal, but they're doing it in the name of a president who is, you know, quite seen as quite the humanitarian. Oh, yeah. It's this the, the paradox of war. And and Lincoln's presidency starts to shape this this new presidency presidency that you're gonna see. And it's the first I I really Think that it's the first example since since Washington, and I mean I include Jackson in this, who shaped the presidency in a modern image himself. But Lincoln takes the presidency really for the first time since Washington, and just goes right. This is what it is. Yeah, I I've know. got this power, and if you're going to be president, you need to do this. The reason I sort of say the first three is because I don't count them as shaping the presidency. I count them as finding the presidency. They set the benchmark. Jackson, yes, I would say was one of the first to start to change it and rule, governed by veto and whatnot. But Lincoln is in the model that we now associate with what you might call a progressive or a much more uh, active executive, the kind that you find with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, FDR, LBJ. A man that will not be mentioned in the same breath as any of those people. <laughs> Andrew Johnson. I, I need to address Andrew Johnson. Now, we talked about the, the, the benefits of picking your vice president. And as part of the, the national union ideal that, that Lincoln puts together, he goes, pick me a Democrat. Pick me a Democrat and he'll be my vice president. Um, I'll, I'll go with a brand new vice president. Johnson is the southern... You know, he's, he's the southern man who didn't go with the south. So so Andrew Johnson gets 
the vice presidency because basically he stuck around and he's a Democrat. So the idea is it provides this union idea and Lincoln wants to reunite the country. He knows that the reconstruction period that's going to follow is pivotal and he knows that it it can't be party political. Again, one of the great books ever written politically or, or in general is A Team of Rivals, which is um, Doris Kearns Goodwin on, on Lincoln and making a lot of recommendations today. If you want a really fascinating read, you want to read A Team of Rivals. And A Team of, a team of Rivals talks about the fact that Lincoln put together this cabinet of people that wouldn't necessarily agree with him. He wanted people to argue with him. He wanted the best ideas. Johnson is put together as part of this cabinet going forward with the National Union idea because we want a Democrat and we want a Southerner involved so that Reconstruction can be this healing process for the country. One of the criticisms that's levelled at Lincoln by some historians is that he believed he was immortal. And when Lincoln is killed... Johnson, who is completely opposed to the governing party, to everybody else in the cabinet, to everybody else basically around him, is now the president leading a party that doesn't like him. And he's leading Reconstruction, but there's no roadmap on what to do because Lincoln didn't leave anything. Lincoln didn't write down, this is what I want. We, we can assume things from Lincoln and his behaviour. Everybody assumes that Lincoln's idea was to be far more conciliatory, was to bring the South back in, mm. make everything sort of try to make everything right again. Um, Johnson is not as strong willed in some regards as Lincoln, although in other regards, look at the number of vetoes that he uses, he's pig headed. Um, Johnson doesn't really have a clear roadmap as to what he's going to do when they say to him about how are we going to do this and how are we going to start this. Johnson is the one who says when they come to me and personally ask, <laughs> they have to personally ask me that I will pardon them. And once they've done this, then and only then. So he's already making it the South has to beg for forgiveness. Not a good start. Yeah. And, and Johnson is kind of road mapping this on his own, on his own terms. And, yeah, it, it's, it's the example of what not to do when picking a vice president. And he also has a first. It's the first time we go through an impeachment process. Uh, only to be uh, rivaled in terms of uh, media interests by the Clinton one. And, and the argument that always gets put forward about why Andrew Johnson wasn't impeached, it wasn't that they didn't think that he probably should be. The argument was that did they really want Congress to have that much power do you want the, the, the do you want the house of reps and the senate do you want them to have so much power that they can just pull a president from office mm. and that was the reason given by the, the dissenting voters who voted the other way to just save him and he's literally just saved it was do we really want this president on our hands i think that's one of the checks and balances and this is where the with the lincoln post lincoln era um, you start to see this graying of the waters of uh, of the checks and balances. So, as you've just said, the the Congress starting to err on whether they should really check and balance Johnson. Lincoln taking those powers is really the executive erring on whether those checks and balances should exist. We start to see a a changing in the nature of the uh, the government in America slowly in the next 50 years, but then much more rapidly in the next 100 years. And with that changing nature of government, we, we, we get to... Johnson has also has something that, that pops up that not, not... I was going to say not many people after him have, but before that there's a number of presidents who just aren't nominated by their own party. Mm. And we get a few more after Johnson who just... Their own party, party goes, no, nah, uh, we're not doing that again. Thanks. And Johnson suffers. Yeah, Johnson suffers big time. No one wants to nominate him because, you know, look, he's, he's not a Republican. So the Republicans aren't putting their Republican president up for and nomination. The Democrats, again. he's not a Democrat. And the Democrats just go, no way, we, we're North. not putting you up. So we're looking for a strong guiding light. There's only one strong guiding light in America at this point in time, which is Ulysses Grant. <sighs> Ulysses Grant. First of all, Grant's the first president that tries to go past presidential convention in that he's the first president to seek a third term, mm. which he doesn't get. And if you know anything about Grant's presidency, there's a reason Grant doesn't get a third term. Grant himself 
found it difficult with, with regards to presidential power. This is his checks and balances again. He was a general. He's used to getting unilateral decisions made. Lincoln, you know, obviously got unilateral decisions made, but he's a wartime president. Grant is not a wartime president. So Grant can't just do this. He has to work with he has to work with the Congress. He has to work with the House. He has to work with the Senate. He he, he can't work with these people. Also, he doesn't choose his advisors wisely. He doesn't choose his cabinet wisely. And you get probably the most corrupt presidency that America has seen in the Grant era, although there was no suspicion that Grant was actually on the take. Himself. On the take. Again, as, as is frequently pointed out by people, he actually gave up his military pension to become president of the mm. United States. He gave up more money. He could have just stayed off and just got a general's pension for the rest of his life and lived quite comfortably. But he gives that up to become president, which is a massive pay cut. Mm. Um, but the, the scandal, the amount of scandal around him, and it's this, also the starting of this investigation by journalists into the White House itself. Mm, yeah, well, it's, it preempts the muckrucking, the muckracking that uh, yeah. Theodore Roosevelt has to uh, it, not not necessarily contend with, but what he calls out. And I think this is a lot of people say, you know, McKinley and Roosevelt, they they're the birth of the 20th century. I think if the gestation period was to be considered, this is where the... the, the troublesome the, teenage years? Yeah, this is where it's really starting to start because... I'm not doing what you tell me, Mum. I'm going to vote for someone who, who, who's going to do nothing. Lincoln's invited the idea of like a cult or celebrity <laughs> following uh, for a president. Uh, Grant certainly has uh, promoted that idea of him being the hero of the North and the saviour of the Union and all this, because now that Lincoln's dead, there needs to be a new hero. So he sort of assumes that mantle, willingly or unwillingly, is always arguable. And again, somewhat ironically with Grant under the, under the headline of Let There Be Peace, you know, yeah. that's his campaign slogan, is yeah. Let There Be Peace. He sizz of the enemy all over all, the place. All over Atlanta. Yeah. Um. Um, so <laughs> he's really... And then the the almost invitation of the the media to, uh, by by default, because, I mean, you've got so much corruption going on, you're inviting the media to come in because, you know, why wouldn't they? What else are they going to report on? Mm. Uh, it is called the Gilded Age for a reason, uh, and we go into it. it everyone sort of says uh, Grant is one of the most corrupt presidents, but I think, um, yes, while or the administration was corrupt, I think that corruption just spreads through the next three or four as well. Well, there's corruption and there's just ineptness. Um, <laughs> again, the bumbling presidencies. Um, and, you know, there's a few guys who, unfortunately, like Rutherford B. Hayes does nothing. Um, and, again, he... I've heard one historian refer, refer to him as his fraudulency because <laughs> um, Rutherford Hayes wins by one vote in the Electoral College and it's very it's dodgy. Again, there is there is a compromise. It's the removal of troops from the South. Yeah. So the deal is we will let you have Hayes as your president if you for the Republican Party if you take the troops out of the South. So it's it's a bribe. Mm. Hayes becomes president in the Electoral College based on a bribe of we're going to hold this up until you take oh, the troops. Missing boat, uh, vote ballots. And yeah, it was it was bags just, going. It was yeah, not particularly good, and it's, it's it's a bleak time for American politics. You get James Garfield who gets shot, um, Chester A. Arthur again. When we want to talk about incompetency, this is a guy who, well, let's face it, his his previous. He was a tax collector in New York and fired by Grant for corruption. Yeah. He, he has no other experience. He's named vice president because, again, what do you do to people that you don't like? You bury them in the vice presidency. And Chester A. Arthur is buried in the vice presidency, and the next thing you know, oh. dead. Um, and Chester A. Arthur becomes president, and we, we get up to then Grover. Oh, Grover. Grover just wanted to come in and manage the economy again, and this is this idea of the small government idea. Mm. Grover Cleveland has no plan for America beyond corruption busting mm. because as the governor of New York, Cleveland had spent all of his time busting corruption. Yeah, you know, Tammany Hall, yeah. uh, the police union. Tammany Hall's what made his, made his name, really. Yeah. So it's... it's that, that, that's his election. Um, he, he ran as an anti-corruption guy and pointed to the quote-unquote cleanliness of New York, and given the previous, what, like 16 years of ineptitude, the, the public was happy to, A, vote in their first Democrat, mm. which is a notable point, um, but B, also vote in 
a, an anti-corruption guy. And there's there's a, there's a couple of look. Cleveland Cleveland is notable for a couple of reasons. One, he comes in as the as the corruption buster. Two, this is the period where, and we talked about it briefly before, post Lincoln. The Congress just looks and goes, right, those powers that you've had, yeah. we want them back. This is where this is run completely out of the House and the Senate. These this presidencies are, are governed by legislature. This is Jeffersonian to the end, yep. uh, to the point where I've seen uh, a couple of historians refer to uh, the post-Lincoln presidents as clerks-in-chief. All they're there to do is sign or veto if required. Which is, you know, again, accurate when you look at who the presidents there yeah. are. I mean, Cleveland didn't care about governing. Cleveland just wanted to you know, manage the money and make sure the money wasn't being used for ill-gotten gains. Mm. This is what Grover Cleveland wants. Also with Grover Cleveland, you get a very interesting presidential fact is that he's the first guy to lose and come back. Yeah, and when they were when they were unpacking when they were packing up the White House, and again, it's his wife, it's the first lady, who is the driving force behind that. And the the reason he gets his second term is that his first lady is very popular. His wife's very popular. And when they're packing up the White House, when Benjamin Harrison wins wins the White House, um, she turned around to the people packing the White House up and said, "Take care of all this stuff because we're going to be back here in four years' time." And in four years' time, Benjamin Harrison, who I think one historian puts it, the only thing notable about Benjamin Harrison's reign is that there's nothing notable about Benjamin Harrison's yeah, presidency. Harrison's largely uh, he does blip, and there's no one else. Like this is, we sort of look at politics today and say, oh, there's so many viable candidates. We need a primary, and we've got to sort it all out. At this time, the Democrats literally had no one else who could have run a national election to win yes. except Grover Cleveland. So he's yeah. by default. So Cleveland comes back and you get Cleveland comes back for his, his second go at, at, at the White House. And then things start changing. Yeah, this is where you draw, if, as a historian, you, you draw a line because there are more, uh, th- throughout the pre-McKinley era, uh, era, the expansionist presidents, the presidents who are both exceptional in expanding the role of the president, they are exceptions to the rule, which is the rule being you sit there and you sign off on things. After this, McKinley this onwards, the exception to the rule is the person who sits there and does nothing. And the, the thing with McKinley, and again, McKinley's most well known for getting shot, but the thing with McKinley is McKinley is, is the president who embraces the technological age. Mm. McKinley is, I think, the first one on film. Um, it's a film, a uh, voice recording. Yeah, voice recording as well. Um, McKinley uh, believes in this technology. Mm-hmm. He goes, and one of the reasons why McKinley is able to be shot is that, you know, he liked, well, a couple of, couple of interesting things about McKinley. First of all, he runs his first campaign from his house, mm-hmm. like from the front doorstep. We're not actually joking about that. He gives all these stump speeches in his first yeah. campaign out the front this of his house. This was a time where you didn't yeah. actively pursue or campaign it was still a tradition to not necessarily go around now the train stopping and going around that Mm. really comes out with mckinley and roosevelt but for the most part uh mckinley sort of held on to the tradition of oh you can come to me and i'll talk but i'm not going to go out that's just tacky exactly but but william mckinley um embraced technology he embraced these new gadgets and said that america needed to start developing all Mm. of these sorts of things you get mckinley Again, his first campaign he does from, from his front front room of his house, but he also believed in pressing the flesh. He liked getting amongst the people. Mm. He liked going to the people. He liked getting close up to the people, um, which is also how he's able to be shot because he you know, won too many um, where he got too close to the people again. Um, and McKinley is a, he's a fairly strong leader. I mean, his first term's setting himself up for a really strong second term. The other interesting part about McKinley, and, and it became, again, at the time it would have just been seen as a blip, but he picks a hero from war as his running mate for the second term. Just a quick reminder, that's the end of part one. If you want part two, feel free to go and download that. We'll talk about Teddy Roosevelt and beyond. Thank you for listening, everybody. Keep the feedback coming and hope you enjoy part two. 